الحمد للہ الحمد للہ الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدی لولا ان هدان اللہ وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا محمد رسول الله والذين معه الشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عسيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحدي حدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين في كتابه الكريم إن الذين آمنوا ثم كفروا ثم آمنوا ثم كفروا ثم ازدادوا كفرا لم يكن الله ليغفر لهم ولا ولا ليهديهم سبيلا بشر المنافقين بأن لهم عذابا أليما الذين يتخذون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين أن يبتغون عندهم العزة فإن العزة لله جميعا Brothers and sisters, committed Muslims. These ayat are from Surah An-Nisa, ayah numbers 137 through 139. Roughly translated, they mean, Behold, those who make a secure commitment to Allah and then deny Allah and then go back and make a secure commitment to Allah and then once again deny Allah and then remain stubborn in their denial of Him. Allah will in no way forgive them And he will not guide them upon a straight path.
and announce to the allegiance betrayers that there is ready for them a painful torment. For these are the ones who would take the deniers of Allah in preference to the committed Muslims as their allies. Hoping to secure a degree of honor with these deniers of Allah. When indeed it is Allah alone who gives honor and who honors validation. In the conditions of the world that we Muslims find ourselves in, in conditions that we have to endure, it would be instructive to remind ourselves of these ayat. That there are amongst us traitors, turncoats, sellouts, betrayers, who would rather sell their soul than to close ranks with other Muslims and sell their souls to those who are considered to be the existential enemies of those who love Allah's Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam and those who love Allah For these ayat go over some of the characteristics of nifaq or some of the characteristics that belong to those who are referred to as al-munafiqeen. One of their characteristics as this ayah designates is that they bounce back and forth between a public commitment to Allah and a private commitment to kufr. And it is, it is this bouncing back and forth between a superficial im iman and a died in the wool kufr. It is this back and forth that leads to a type of escalation which intensifies their kufr. Nifaq or dual loyalty. A loyalty, a public loyalty to Allah but a private loyalty to kufr. Nifaq is the failure of the human will to stand up for truth and justice in the face of tyranny and oppression. For certainly a bona fide commitment to Allah, a secure commitment to Allah, will take its bearer into circumstances that court death. But a superficial commitment to Allah, the type of commitment displayed by the munafiqeen, a superficial commitment is what devolves into cowardice and it devolves into a type of pandering to those who consider themselves to be rivals to Allah's authority and power on earth. Notice how one of these ayat begin. بَشِّرِ الْمُنَافِقِينَ أَنَّ لَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا this word Bashir, it means give the good news. But how is it possible to give good news of a painful torment? It seems like a contradiction in terms. 
If I was to tell you that you're going to be tortured, that's not good news. But nonetheless, that's what the ayah says. And it uses seemingly contradictory terms to describe a contradictory psychology in these munafiqeen. For they feign a ritual Islam. If you look at them, it appears on the face of it that they're Muslims. But you don't know what's going on inside. And what reveals that which is going on inside is a power imbalance where the odds, the worldly odds are stacked against the committed Muslims. And when you see a situation like that, where the pendulum of power is swinging against the Muslims, that is the situation that reveals the true character of the munafiqeen. There are perhaps scores of ayat in the Qur'an that describe the fact that the physical presence of these characters is with the Muslims. But their psychological character is with the kuffar. Their rituals may be with the Muslims. But the way that they make their decisions, the way that they give their allegiance, the way that they decide on who to side with, all of that is determined by the kuffar in the world, the rivals to Allah's power. And these, these kafirs, the deniers of Allah's authority, the rejecters of His power, these kafirs come in all shapes and sizes. But what binds them together is that they represent a political and ideological opposition to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the time of Allah's Prophet, this political and ideological opposition was coming from the Yahud, the Zionists of that day. And brothers and sisters, I'm not quoting these ayat to go over history. For as you listen to these ayat, and whatever explanation is being given, your mind ought to be working to equate the nature of those ayat and the words of those ayat with the facts of life on the ground today. For the power culture at the time of Allah's Prophet wasallam, that formed an ideological opposition to the expansion of Allah's deen on earth, that political and ideological opposition was centered in the Yahud. And the political and ideological opposition to the truth in today's world is also centered in that same community. And so these words are current. They do not only have a historical impact. And if you find it hard to equate those historical words with the dynamics on the ground today, then I'm sorry that you are having a hard time equating the guidance that you ought to be applying in the world today that came to you 1400 years ago. Even at that time, there were ritual first Muslims who were beating a path to these Yahud. readying themselves to display their subservient credentials in the face of Yahudi power. And these meetings between these munafiqs and the Yahud of that day, they took place in secret. 
there was a lot of cunning involved in arranging the timing of these meetings. But there was only one thing that they discussed in these meetings. Just as the imperialists and Zionists today, there is only one thing that they are concerned about in their private meetings. And that is how to undermine the emerging justice and truth that comes with this deen. How to undermine the central leadership role of Allah's Prophet and the inheritors of that role in our world today. But ultimately what it came down to with regard to these munafiqs is that they had a misplaced recognition of the application and the ownership of power and pride. They thought that power and pride and glory belongs to whatever temporal power culture exists in the day. In the day. And they failed to recognize that pride and power belong unconditionally and absolutely to Allah. And that was their fundamental failure. And they always ended up taking the wrong side then, and today they're taking the wrong side. But as I said just a little bit earlier, these ayat mean absolutely nothing until they help us understand the facts of life on the ground today. These ayat should not be suspended between an abstract that belongs to our imagination and a reality that we feel comfortable withdrawing from. These words are real. They are describing and helping us understand the dynamics in our world today. The political dynamics, the ideological dynamics, the military dynamics, and the economic dynamics. And the actors in this script, though their names may have changed, their identity is one and the same. For there was an Arab Arabian nifaq that was subservient to an ideological power culture in that day. And today, there is an Ar Arabian nifaq that is subservient to the ideological power culture today. And so if the nifaq at that time could be identified, why is it so hard for us to identify and point to the nifaq today? Let us go over a little bit of history. And this is history that perhaps all of us or perhaps most of us can remember. For it is only four decades ago. But it sort of sets the stage for what you see happening in your real world right now. The players then belonged to the, to the Royal Arabians of the Gulf and the inheritors of the Royal Arabians today are playing out the same script. And so if you can understand what happened four decades ago, you can understand what's happening today. And obviously all within the context of these ayat. Back in the 1980s, these royals were proving their subservient cred credentials to imperialism and Zionism. Not by their rituals, but by their policy decisions. By their running to the imperialists and Zionists for protection 
any time the committed Muslims raise their voices about injustice. Some of you may recall that during the Reagan-Bush years from 1980 through 1990, there was this incident that occurred with the so-called Contras. This was a paramilitary counterinsurgency that was set up by the White House to overthrow the elected Sandinista government in Nicaragua. And so the warlords in Washington, they had a problem. How are we going to finance an illegal activity? We, after all, are the citadel of democracy and freedom and liberty. And here we are trying to overthrow a democratically elected government. We can't be seen doing something like that. So how are we going to finance this terrorist outfit that's going to thro overthrow an elected government? And so they call on their subservient vassals who were too eager to help. At that time, it was the father of the current Saudi ambassador to the United States. He was often called Bandar Bush. So they called on their vassals that they knew were full of cash. And they said, what can you do for us? And being all too eager to help, they came in and offered one million dollars a month to send to the Contras. In addition to that, they set up an eight million dollar slush fund in a Swiss bank that could be accessed by these terrorists that were called a counterinsurgency outfit. And all told, at the end of this whole conflict, which almost brought down an entire U.S. presidency, they gave $32 million. But that was not enough. Also during those years, there was a first Gulf War. in which the combination of all these Taghut and Kuffar tried to destroy the Islamic revolution in Islamic Iran. In fact, the financial contribution was so huge at the time to the tune of one billion dollars a month. Today, that would be something on the order of over 20 billion dollars a month or perhaps more than that but at the time the Reagan regime right here in Washington put pressure on its subservient proxies in Kuwait Saudi Arabia and Egypt to send US arms to Iraq so that the combination of these people, the Gulf Arabian monarchies, the Israelis, the Americans, the Europeans, and even the Soviet Union, all of them got together, even with the use of chemical weapons, to at least try to cripple or even to undermine and overthrow the Islamic revolution in Iran. But they failed. They failed to such an extent that this failure is what led to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. For this eight-year war, not only did it consume the lives of some one million young men on both sides of the conflict, But it left a lot of territorial 
and infrastructure destruction in the cities of those two countries. And so Saddam Hussein, he asked, or he demanded from these Gulf monarchies, I fought this war for eight years for you guys. And now I need money to reconstruct my country. They want to have nothing to do with it. They washed their hands clean. We're not going to give you any money to reconstruct your country. They were all too ready to give billions of dollars to destroy. But they were not ready to give a penny to reconstruct. And this is another one of the characteristics of nifaq. That it would leverage any and all resources for the purpose of destruction. But when it comes to the purpose of construction and to build, they're all out of resources. What are they saying today with regard, with regard to all of the havoc that they have created and caused in North Africa and the Muslim East? They're saying that those people have to pay with their own oil revenue to reconstruct their societies. They didn't destroy their own societies. There were missiles and bombs manufactured in other parts of the world that destroyed their societies. There were real policies that destroyed their societies. There were real strategies that destroyed their societies. And because they don't have any power in the world, they can't leverage anything in terms of resources to come and rebuild their societies. الَّذِينَ يَتَّخِذُونَ الْكَافِرِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَيَبْتَغُونَ عِنْدَهُمُ الْعِزَّةِ فَإِنَّ الْعِزَّةَ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يغفر لكم فاسترشدوه يرشدكم Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Let's bring this notion of nifaq into even more focus with what's going on right now. What we described happened 40 years ago, but it established a basis for what's happening right now. There's this person by the name of Dr. Mike Evans. He is the founder of the Friends of Zion Heritage Center. He recently had a meeting with the Crown Prince of that family which is occupying Mecca and Al Madinah. Now first of all, before I get into the gist of their conversation, let me ask you, is it possible for somebody like you and me to go and have a discussion with the Crown Prince of Arabia? Even if he wanted to give him good counsel about adjusting his behavior, is it possible for any one of us regardless of our credentials, to go and have a meeting with him? But yet, you have the founder of the Friends of Zion Her Heritage Center. Just has to press, press a button and the prince is ready to have a meeting. So anyway, they have this meeting and this person comes out and he describes what they talked about. And obviously he has no reason to lie because you know this is something that supports his biases. 
And so in that situation, you really have no reason to lie. And so he comes out and he says, and he's talking to uh, a conference, a yearly conference of the Jerusalem Post. So basically he's probably talking to a large number of non-Muslims, many of whom probably happen to be Jewish. And so he comes out and he tells this audience that you would be surprised at how these royal figures in Saudi Arabia feel about you. He said you'd be really surprised because when we talked I became aware of the fact that these royals that they f fervently support Israel a lot more than most Jews. This is Dr. Mike Evans talking. He's saying that these royals and especially MBS that they have a more fervent support for Israel than most Jews. And so then this Mr. Evans, this Dr. Evans asked MBS, how do you feel about Christians and Jews? So MBS says, why I love them. So he says, why? He says, well, my mother was a Jewish evangelical. So Dr. Evans says, well, he says, well, I find that hard to believe. So he said, no, not my biological mother, but the woman who raised me, the house director that my father chose, when I was a very young person, that house director was an Ethiopian evangelical Jew. Sort of reminds you in our history some 1400 years ago about one of the sons of Muawiyah that was raised by a Christian. He went on, his army went on to give the shahada to Imam Hussein. Alayhi salatu was salam. And so then he asks him, Dr. Evans asks MBS, what should the Palestinians do? So MBS says, copy Israel. The Palestinians should copy Israel. Brothers and sisters, I'm sorry to have to live in a day in which this level of nifaq perhaps has not been exceeded in our entire history. Where this level of treachery Perhaps treachery with a ferocity. I'm sorry to live in a day where we have to witness something like this. And now it has become official. And flags are flying in front of these buildings. There is an official Saudi embassy in Tel Aviv. And there is an official Israeli embassy in al -Riyadh. The same people who were trying to gin up a provocation for war in the 1980s, those same people are around today trying to do the same thing. And by now I'm sure all of you have heard and you've read the news of a U.S. drone being shot down by Islamic Iran. And I'm sure that you've read all the news about how this information is being presented. <coughs> but some of the things that you may not have read <coughs> is that this drone took off from a U.S. base in the United Arab Emirates. 
On top of that, this drone was accompanied by a surveillance airplane that had 35 people on board and both the drone and the surveillance aircraft violated Iranian airspace. They have no reason to lie in this regard. They're not looking to pick a fight with the United States or with anybody else. But on the other side, yes, you know that the United States, backed up by provocation from Arabia and from Israel, is looking to pick a fight, is looking for a war with Islamic Iran. And so I'm saying that Islamic Iran has no reason to lie about this. So there were 35 people on board that surveillance aircraft. The drone was unmanned. And Islamic Iran says that it gave them warnings. Several warnings. Before it shot a missile to, to shoot the drone down. Now Islamic Iran also said that it could have shot down the airplane with 35 people on board. But it refused to do that because it did not want casualties to complicate an already precarious situation. Besides that, and I don't know if you've heard this or not, the drone and the surveillance aircraft turned off their transponders. This is a violation of international aviation regulations. And also whenever an aircraft intentionally turns off its transponder, this is a universal signal that that airborne vehicle is doing something suspicious. And there are yet more facts that are going to come out, more details that are going to come out about this incident provided that it doesn't launch the itchy trigger, trigger finger of the guy in the White House. And lastly, the cost of that drone is a hundred million dollars. And it appears that in order to incite a provocation for war, a hundred million dollars doesn't mean a thing to the warmongers. For them it's not even a drop in the bucket. They know that they're not paying for them for, for this hundred million dollars out of their tax pocket, it's coming out of the future earnings of American taxpayers. So they don't care. And these are the ones in the White House that are supposed to be the ones that are fiscally responsible. They talk about fiscal responsibility all the time. How are we going to pay for this? How are we going to pay for that? And here's a hundred million dollars that they decided to sacrifice on a provocation to war. And obviously it's not the first hundred million dollars, and it's not the first billion dollars that they choose for such provocations. Because they know it's not coming out of their pockets. It's coming out of the pockets of the gullible American. The American who's busy on Facebook, who's busy in a whole bunch of other distracting ventures, that they can't pay attention to those who are leeching their own economy. And not only was this drone cannon fodder, what about those 35 people that are sitting on board the surveillance aircraft that violated the airspace of an independent country? What about them? Are they just bait? Do their lives mean nothing to the White House? Do their lives mean nothing to Washington? Do their lives mean nothing to the United States? Obviously, their lives mean nothing to imperialism and Zionism. Because the ones who are pushing the buttons, they're not out doing the fighting. They're, not, they're the ones who are creating the conflict where others fight. Where mostly you and I are the ones who die. And where their own come back maimed. 
And so when election time comes around, they'll make a big hoo-ha about the veterans and uh, that they care for them and blah, blah, blah. And that they don't want any more foreign wars. And when the elections are over, it's back to the same old script. Brothers and sisters, that's why these ayat ought to mean something to us. There is no way on earth, none whatsoever, that it would be possible to invent a provocation to war were it not for these munafiqs who are in positions of rule, who are allying with the existential enemies of the Muslims. There is no way on earth that imperialism and Zionism could get away with what it's getting away with had they not these allies in the Muslim world. These allies that control the masajid. These allies that control our community centers. These allies that control the narrative that gets dispensed inside of these masajid. Were it not for these types of people, then the Muslims would not be walking out of these masajid with dead minds and dead hearts. It's only left to people out on the street to acquaint the Muslims with what is going on in their real lives. How they're setting up another Muslim country with over 80 million people for the kind of tragedies that they've, that they've foisted on Syria, on Libya, on Somalia, on Lebanon, and a whole host of other countries across the world. That is supposed to be the function of these masajid. They are supposed to alert us to what's coming. They are supposed to alert us to what's going down. They are supposed to put us on the ready. But they've abdicated that function to CNN, to the White House, to 10 Downing Street, to Al Riyadh and to other such places in the world. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatilan wa rizuqna ajtinaaba Allahumma aghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat al-ahyai minhum wal amwat innaka qareebun samiyun mujibu da'awat Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في هسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة